That's great. Thank you so much for uh, for joining us to um, uh, for this talk about uh, the right way uh, to give your B two B copywriter um, a, a good and fulfilling brief. Uh, I can't think of uh, anybody who's uh, better placed uh, to talk to you about this uh, than today's speaker, George Reith. Um, George is a consultant writer here at Radix, which is um, the name that we use for kind of the most senior writers that, that work most closely uh, with our, our, our clients on their kind of ideas and their, their messaging and their campaigns. Uh, and George in particular is the writer that we tend to go to uh, when something really technical and difficult needs explaining really clearly. Um, so you'll find George a lot of the time writing about everything from uh, web isolation, cybersecurity, uh, through to hybrid cloud infrastructure and um, data analytics arrangements. Um, more pertinently, uh, George has been doing this job for, I, I guess, kind of eight or nine years now. Um, and in that time, he's seen a lot of briefs come through from clients, some of them brilliant, some of them may be less than brilliant, although I'm sure he'd be um, too, uh, too discreet to, to, to say so, <laughs> but he has seen kind of the good, the bad and, and the ugly of copywriting briefs, so he's extremely well placed. Uh, to talk to you about this subject. Um, so uh, the attendees are here. Uh, George, why don't you uh, take it away? Sure thing. Thanks for that introduction, David. And uh, thanks to everyone here for, uh, for joining me today to talk about this. Um, so I appreciate I've given this uh, this webinar a very lofty title, but I certainly hope in the next 20 to 25 minutes I can fulfill that promise and uh, show you a really, really good way to to brief writers. Um, I think this topic is, is very important because I've seen so many situations where you have very smart very engaged marketers with really good stories about their brand or product or service what have you um, and they have these amazing ideas they get an amazing copywriter and then somehow something happens in the middle where it just doesn't quite fit together and the end result is unfortunately less than the sum of its parts um, and for me i think the briefing process is is the part where that can go wrong and so i think it's something that you know we we have a, a big incentive to try and solve both as writers and the people briefing them um so in terms of who this is for this is mainly for people who you know have to brief writers that's probably quite clear um i think the the lessons within apply both to if you work with an agency and you have to brief writers as part of an account management or traffic management role but i think it's equally uh, useful information if you work directly in-house as a marketing leader and you need to work with writers uh, as part of that role um and if you're here and you're a writer like me uh, this isn't directly aimed at you but i still think there'll be a lot of information here that you can take to your clients to help show them the best ways to brief you Okay, so just a tiny little bit of housekeeping. Um, there will be a kind of bigger Q&A section at the end, but uh, please ask questions as we go. If I say anything that twigs a thought and you want to ask a question about it, feel free to um, jump in the Q&A box or the chat and ask away. Um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping some of the value here in this webinar is that you get to talk to me, someone who's done a lot of writing and seen a lot of briefs, and ask me questions about uh, what I'd love to see in briefs you might be giving to, uh, to writers down the line. Okay. So what are we going to be covering today? Um, first off, we'll be having a quick look at why briefing is actually really, really hard. <laughs> um, and then we'll be looking at the two main ways that we overcome any of those challenges, which is through really good briefing documents and hosting really successful briefing calls as well. And then, of course, we'll have that Q&A that I promised. But first, before we begin, um, I'd like to run just a really quick poll just to learn a little bit more about all of you. Um, I'd love to know in particular what your job roles are, um, just so I can sort of tailor the advice I'm going to give you to, uh, to things that will be most relevant to you and your role. So, David, if we're able to bring up that poll, that would be great. So there are a few options there. I've tried to cover most of the bases of people I could imagine are joining this call, but um, there's another box as well. And uh, if you click that, if you want to tell us a bit more about you know your role and uh, and what's attracted you to this webinar in the chat, that would be great. Cool. Okay, the results are just coming in now. Okay, a surprising split. <laughs> here actually we've got um, 
quite a few copywriters joining, about 44% of you are copywriters, uh, a third of you are agency account or traffic managers, and uh, we've got one each of in-house marketers and content strategists with us today. So an, an interesting spread considering we've got uh, nine people <laughs> overall. I thought they might be a bit more clustered considering the size of this group. That's fantastic. So hopefully I'll try and uh, go quite broad with the advice so it will help all of you. But um, yes, we'll, we'll see how we go with that. But that's great. Thank you. Okay. So what is it about briefing that, that uh, is, is really hard? <laughs> I think really it comes down to to context um, and the different levels of that. So, you know, if you bring a, a copywriter into a project, depending on who you bring in, they probably are lacking a lot of information that you as the person briefing already have. So they might not know much about the product you might be talking about, brand, the tone of voice of that brand, maybe even the industry, depending on the type of writer you've hired. Now, some of these things a writer may already come primed with knowledge, particularly if they're somebody you've worked with before, or possibly they're an industry specialist like we are at Radix, and they hopefully know a lot about the, the industry they specialize in already, so they won't need all this spoon feeding to them. But still, any project might bring up new things that, that the writer has to get their head around really quickly. And I think the challenge comes in that if you're someone who's a real expert in your field, you almost have to kind of imagine what they don't know and what they need to know and, and put yourself in their shoes and explain it in a way that, that can help a rider get up to speed quickly. And I think that's really hard if you've been working in a field for a very long time. It's difficult to gauge the best balance of giving them all the information they need without overwhelming them. So hopefully uh, in the next couple of slides, I'll explain a good way to find that balance and give that writer all the context they need to uh, do the best job they can. So uh, not to overload you with polls, but I'm going to ask for another poll just to see how people feel about this dichotomy, the binary choice of do you go briefing document, do you go briefing call, do you go for both possibly? Um, I'd love to know from your experiences for people setting briefs, what do you prefer? And for the writers uh, here among us, um, which, which do you prefer to receive? So that poll should be up now. I'm very interested to see what the, uh, the answer is going to be to this one. OK, interesting. So we've got uh, just short of half, say, briefing document, just short of half, say, both. And uh, we've got a small group that says briefing calls, so they're preferred. So that's really interesting to me. I think, um, you know, briefing documents being favoured, it does make sense because particularly for a lot of the writers that are here, you might prefer to see something written because that's the medium you work in is, is words, of course, uh, written words specifically. But um, <laughs> I don't think I'm going to uh, to shock or surprise you by saying that I, I think both is best. So um, there's no wrong answer here, by the way. It does come down to preference uh, ultimately. But I think if you are comfortable doing both, um, that's the best way forward because I think it gives you a powerful one-two combo of giving your writer a lot of background information in a briefing document and then the chance to ask any questions, probe a little bit deeper with um, a subject matter expert on a, a briefing call. So we're going to cover those two in turn. So first, we'll be talking about briefing documents and how to get these right. Now, I thought the most helpful thing would be to run through what goes into, in my mind, what is the ideal briefing document? What does it include? What are all the points it hits? Now, I really, really wanted to find a way to convey all this information to you in a way that wasn't just a checklist of lots of things to put in. However, as much as I played around with my slides to try and not do that, that seems to be the most helpful way to convey this information, which is effectively a list of things to put in a brief. So bear with me here. We'll try and run through this quite quickly. I'll explain as we go. Um, but don't worry about furiously taking notes. We will be sending around slides after this. So um, you'll have all this uh, information at hand. So I've grouped these into categories. I think an obvious one is that you need information about the asset that's being written. What, what is it? What is this piece of content? Is it an ebook, a blog, an infographic? How long is it? What's the rough word count or number of pages? You don't need an exact answer for that, by the way, but if you can put some detail, especially for writers that, um, you know, you might be needing to get a direct quote from them, you'll get a much more specific answer if you can give a, as specific an answer to this as possible. You'll get a, a better quote out of it. And then, you know, where it will be used, because this can help, you know, if you're working with an experienced writer who's worked on all sorts of content types before, it could be that, you know, 
they come up with actually a bit of a twist on something that you didn't expect that can add lots of value. For instance, I've had situations before I've been asked to write, you know, a six to eight page brochure that they want to leave behind at a sales meeting. And then you've got to suddenly think, well, if you really want eight pages, is someone going to read that straight after having a meeting about something? Maybe, maybe not. It led to quite a useful conversation, I think, for this client. But I wouldn't have been able to have that conversation with them if they didn't tell me how this thing was being used. So that's a really important piece to get in there. And of course, um, things about tone of voice are, are great to put in as well. I could almost put that as a completely separate category and all the elements of tone and voice that go in, but um, that, <laughs> that might be a whole webinar in it is, itself, to be honest, because um, there's a lot there. Now, I know some of these things are really obvious, by the way, but you'd be surprised how many times key information like this gets left off uh, a brief, you know, normally because there's probably more important fish to fry, but some of these foundational elements are, are really important for a writer to know up front. Okay, next up is the objectives. Now, none of this is going to make it into direct copy, I'm sure, but um, it's so useful if your writer knows what your aims are as a marketing team, as a brand. So for the particular piece they're writing, what is it meant to do? And especially if it has any KPIs or hard number goals, metrics it needs to hit, this is really important as well, because say if I'm writing an email campaign for a client, I'll adjust the way I approach it slightly based on if they need to get really good open rates, if they need to get really large click through rates to whatever the email is promoting. It's, it's just a slight slant that I'll apply to the copy there. Um, so that can be really useful for a writer to know. And of course, um, it's good for them to know if it's part of something broader. Is it just one piece of a long marketing campaign and they need to be aware of an asset that comes before or after? These are all really important things for them to know. Okay, another big section audience you know we all know that you need to know your audience to deliver a good piece of content but i think i've seen a lot of briefs where they almost play like audience bingo where it's like yep cto cio ceo and you just sort of list off job titles and go yep that's the audience great done we'll move on but i think there's a lot of value in briefs that go deeper so i think obviously understanding more about the type of business the industry is probably a given but um even if you have a very specific industry like say retail and you know you're writing for that type of organization knowing the rough size and type is going to be really useful information because the way i might write to a multinational retailer would be very different to something more locally based that's just in one country they'll have very different needs and um, requirements uh, job role we've already covered a little bit but any more details about that and what their job entails specifically can be really useful especially if um, somebody hasn't dealt with that type of audience before and more importantly, what they know about the subject you're going to be writing about. There's always a fine line to be had where you don't want to over explain things and you know condescend to your audience. But of course, you don't want to just assume loads of knowledge and, and blast through and, uh, and possibly leave your audience behind. So um, if you can give any insights to your writer about the level of knowledge you'd expect from your audience, that's always really, really helpful. And of course, what challenges they face. This can really help with making copy that's a bit more emotionally resonant. If you've got an idea of what keeps your uh, your target audience up at night that's always great to share and a big one again I'm, I'm showing my bias here because I primarily write um, for b2b uh, marketing um, so you know there's a very complicated decision making process for any purchase in a company particularly when they get to a certain size and so understanding who's making those decisions and who influences them is is you know huge in terms of how you position certain elements of copy so if you know that make sure you put it in your briefs okay and um, I've called this all context. It's quite a woolly term, but I think there's a lot of useful information that just helps set up what's going on in this um, project that you're bringing a writer into. Um, so why are you writing about the thing you're writing about now? I think particularly in um, B2B tech, you know, there's lots of evergreen things. If I'm writing about a product or service that saves time, saves money, makes processes more efficient, businesses have wanted to do that since the dawn of time, really. But why now? What's special in this industry what's happening that makes this particularly relevant that's always great um, that's going to help your writer nail the introduction and sort of set the scene which is probably the hardest bit of writing any long form copy so um, do them a favor and put as much info there as you can that will really help them out um, and of course why the audience is interested in that particularly and if there's just any bigger picture things going on with that industry you might be talking to, that role. I don't know, there might be some big piece of legislation or new regulations coming in that might be changing the game quite a bit. Anything like that you can include is really helpful. Uh, quick one, key messages. I think I've never seen a brief not include this, by the way. So this is a bit of a given, but um, 
you know, main things you need to say to the audience in terms of, I don't know, it might be product features or new ways of working, big picture ideas. But um, it's always good if you can then tie these back to any challenges you might have, have thought of for your audience earlier. So there's just a clear link between the two. That can be really helpful. And finally, um, next steps for the reader to take after they've read whatever it is you're creating. Um, most pieces will have some kind of call to action, something you send readers to uh, for more information. Make sure you include that if you can, if you know what it is. And also um, a little bit of information about how you plan to promote pieces, longer pieces like ebooks and white papers. You know, I know a lot of brands will create social campaigns, infographics around them, things like that. Um, I think if you let your writer know in advance that that's the plan, even if they're not the ones writing those promotional pieces, um, it can be really useful because, you know, if I know an infographic is going to be made out of a longer piece I'm writing, I might <laughs> kind of try and include some easy stats that could be pulled out into that to make uh, to make the next writer's job a little bit easier. So that's all something worth including. Now, whew, quick breath. I know I've just thrown <laughs> a lot of information at you about briefs. So you might be thinking to yourself, isn't this a bit much? Surely, you know, some writers, if you include all this information, it's going to be totally overwhelming. And uh, you're absolutely right. It, it really can be. Um, I wanted to try and cover as much uh, of the bases with you as possible in this talk, just so you know the kind of things to look out for. But of course, a lot of this stuff might not be relevant, depending on the type of asset you're briefing on, type of thing you're promoting, what your brand does, um, what your agency does. Uh, you may not need all of this. So I would always encourage you to kind of give as much detail as possible, but have in the back of your mind that sort of so what test of like, okay, so what? You know, I've had firms before, really well-meaning marketers in them doing that thing where they kind of give me like a really like far back history of how all of their like departments have changed, how their business has changed over the years. And it's sort of related to the end story, but also it's quite a lot of information. So at that point I'd kind of ask the, well, so what, how does this all tie into what we're talking about now? I'd argue it maybe didn't, but um, there we are. Um, and I think as a general litmus test as well, if you're having to attach more than about two or three documents to an email, you might be sending to your writer with the brief. You might want to think about trying to trim that back just a little bit. Um, but again, this is a hard one to give you any concrete advice about, because I think it does kind of just come to uh, down to experience. And depending on the types of writers you work with, you know, someone with a clear industry specialism might be able to handle more information on that industry than someone who's new to it. So you might have to just sort of gauge it over time and, uh, and work out the best place for you. Great. So <laughs> we've tackled the big, big part of briefing up front um, about briefing documents. So in the next section, we'll be moving on to briefing calls. This is probably a good time just to check if anyone has any questions about that. Now's a, a really good chance to throw them in the chat with a QA uh, ahead of our sort of, we'll have a proper QA at the end. But if you've got anything now, feel free to throw it my way and uh, I'll try and answer to the best of my ability. Uh, there's no uh, open questions in the, uh, the Q&A yet. Um, oh, and um, mostly the, the, the chat is kind of people saying hello and introducing themselves at, the, at, the, at this stage. So I think you, you, unless anyone has anything that they'd like to kind of throw in at this stage, I think you've probably um, either stunned people into science or explained into silence or explained everything <laughs> so clearly that no one has any questions at all. George. Well, I'd what certainly hope it's the latter, but I do apologise if having just thrown multiple slides at you with a checklist of what to put in briefs, I may have just uh, overwhelmed you. Um, I've done exactly to you what I said not to do to writers, so apologies for that, but uh, there we are. Well, I'll uh, crack on with briefing calls, but uh, if anyone has any questions, do let me know. Okay, so as I said, I feel the briefing document is a really important piece of this puzzle, but it's sort of the setup. That's what gets your writer into knowing kind of roughly where they are, but then they might have questions after that. Hopefully they will anyway, because that means they're really engaged with what's going on. And it's at that point that you want to set up a briefing call. Is this 100% necessary? No. Um, there will be situations where say you have you know, really short pieces, you're just getting a writer in to do some socials, some emails, you may not need a call. But I think it doesn't hurt if you can spare five minutes to you or someone else join a call to quickly chat to a writer and answer any questions. I think it can really help uh, avoid any misunderstandings in, that might come out of a briefing document. Um, so I think where possible, if you can offer access to somebody for a call, that's always the, um, the, the best way to approach things. Um, just seen a question pop up about briefing documents that I'll quickly answer before we move on. Uh, Lisa, that's a really good question about what to, what to do if you don't have all the data um, that I mentioned in that long list of things to include in the, um, the briefing document. You know, 
that happens. There's a lot of moving parts in organizations. If you work with agencies as well, I know the ability, your ability to brief the writer will very much depend on the brief you've received from your clients. So, you know, nobody has perfect information, right? This happens. So if you don't have all the information, I would give as much as you can and just be very clear the information you don't have. Because I think for me, when I see something core in a brief that's missing, my immediate thought is, well, does this just mean we don't know much about the target audience, say? Or does this just mean you've forgotten to tell me? <laughs> and at that point, then I'm like, do I need to ask the question? Do I need to like put the brakes on this and find this out? Or do we just not have it at all? Um, so if you're, you know, I'd just be honest with your writer and say, look, we don't know. And then they'll at least know they don't have to, you know, dig for that information and um, can just move on with other things. Um, good question from Veronica as well. Do you use a template when uh, interacting with clients? Yes, we. I mean, yeah, Radix has its own template. Sometimes uh, organizations we work with uh, will have their own that they send to us. Um, I think, well, I don't know, David, are we able to <laughs> send our template through as an example to people or a different version of it? I think it would be great to show you what a sort of template looks like from our perspective of, of key sort of boxes to hit. Yeah. I mean, I think from from my point of view, we're certainly it's it's not a massive trade secret. Our briefing document. Uh, I don't think we've ever published it on a on a blog post or anything. We've done the checklist, the the, mm. the content checklist that we use for reviewing, and there's no reason why we couldn't share the briefing document. Yeah, well, I mean, I think um, certainly all the main bits of it I've covered here. So if it was a secret, it's not anymore. Sorry. <laughs> well, what, what, what I what I was going to suggest is that. Um, if people are happy for us to to email them after this with the slides, then maybe we can uh, include the the Radix briefing template uh, alongside those slides if we send those around. Yeah, well, that sounds like a good idea to me. And hopefully, Veronica, that will show you kind of what our template looks like. Um, uh, you're asking just to know whether we're able to say no, fill in more before we start. As in, like, if we send a template and they don't fill in enough, do we ever go, hang on, hang on, you've got to fill in more? Um, is that what you're sort of asking, there, Veronica, in that question? I, I yes, yes. So. There's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a very similar question that Andrew's got in the, the uh, question and answer as, as well, uh, which is um, well, it's related, I think. Uh, mm. As a writer, you, you might want to do this at the end because it's probably a big, a, a big subject. It's up to you. Uh, mm. As a writer, how do you approach a client who seems blissfully unaware that they've sent a poor brief or amounts to not a brief at all and let them know what they've sent isn't sufficient to help them meet their goals? Hmm. That's a really good question. Um, and one I've encountered more times than I care to admit. <laughs> so <laughs> to answer your question, <laughs> I tell you what, we'll... We'll come back to this maybe later. I can give you a short answer now, which is that I would suggest you jump on a briefing call because at that point, then the door's open for you to ask all the questions that they haven't touched on in their slightly lacking written yeah. brief. Um, and then at that point, that puts you as the writer in the driver's seat as well. You're not relying on them to kind of guess what you need. You can just ask directly. Um, I think that's the best way to handle it. So obviously that leads me on quite nicely to what we're going to cover now, which is how to to, um, to handle those briefing calls in a good way. Um, but Andrew, if that hasn't answered your question fully, just let me know at the end and we can tackle that. You know, feel free to dive into that question again later and we'll um, and, and we'll talk about it a bit more because it's a really important topic for this. And I uh, had a feeling somebody might ask. Um, cool. So in this context, yes, maybe you as the writer do need a call. Um, I would certainly, this is the reason why I think just having a, a briefing call almost always as standard is really useful. And I know with a lot of our clients, we just do this automatically, almost suggesting we do a call. Um, so you might be wondering, how do you make this go really well? Like I said, it, it it almost shifts the responsibility at this point to the writer. Normally the writer, particularly if they're an experienced one, will kind of do a lot of the driving on the briefing calls to hopefully make that really successful. They should come with good questions to ask, smart things that will get very smart answers. But if you're the one who's hosting the briefing call and getting your writer on it, there's lots of things you can do that um, can help smooth over that process and, and set everyone up for success. Um, I just wanted to put a tiny bit about white labeling on here. This is more appropriate, I suppose, for people from agencies rather than um, working in-house. Because um, I know you might be in situations where you're working with your client and you need to get an external writer on a call and you have that question of, you know, do I, are you upfront about them being from another, uh, another organization or do you say they're part of your team? Um, there's lots of reasons why you might 
want to do either of those things. I'm not going to tell you not to white label because I know it might be a sort of big organization wide policy that you have no control over. But um, it's worth being aware of what that does to a call and, and the writer's ability to to interface with it, because I've had situations before where I've gone on a call and I've been pretty confident I've got everything I need. But then, you know, at the end, I might just say to the subject matter expert I'm speaking to, well, look, can I email you if I get stuck halfway through a long piece? Can I just ask you a quick question on email? Most people are happy to, to oblige with that. But obviously, if I've been white labeled, I can't do that because then my email address will quickly reveal that um, I, I'm not part of the agency or organization I said I was. So that obviously changes the mechanics of it slightly. And you can get into that awkward situation where then I've got to ask someone from the agency to email over a question. And, you know, it, it just elongates the process a little bit. So um, it's just a small note there that uh, it can be worth thinking about how you handle that to, uh, to smooth over those issues. So that's one thing in terms of how you introduce people to each other. Attendees, I think getting the right people on the call is, you know, one of the best ways you can make them go really well. Um, I'd always encourage you to think carefully about who who joins that call. Um, I think for, you know, individual campaigns and things, normally there's a pretty core group of people who might be involved. But I've been on projects where it's a very public piece of uh, content, like, a you know, a whole website, web copy project or something. And, you know, there's lots of people who are very engaged in that process and suddenly i'm on a call with you know dozens of people trying to kind of interview a huge group it's it's very challenging to do that so if you can keep a small group maybe three people four people at best that's um that's a good place to be um it's just worth thinking about who really needs to be there um and to be clear as well i mean three or four people who are actually like properly in the conversation if you have other people who are just listening in or just sort of there to be aware of what's going on that's um that's not too bad but yeah, it's more your writer probably can't interview a dozen people at once, um, unless they're very good at multitasking anyway. Um, so who should those people be that you bring on? Um, I'd always encourage you to try and have three perspectives that you have represented on every call. Now, I say perspectives because these don't need to be three people. It could be one person who just knows a lot of things. Um, but you definitely want at least one person who who understands the marketing side. That might be you if you're um, uh, the marketing expert in, in question, um, just to sort of talk about the objectives, the goals for the piece, all these sorts of things. Um, a voice from sales is always massively helpful for all those questions we discussed earlier about the audience that you want to put in the brief. Having somebody who has a lot of experience speaking with customers directly, they're going to be in the best place to answer those questions. And of course, somebody uh, who's related to the product team or a technical team. If you're writing a piece of content that's very product heavy, it's useful just to sort of have uh, them as a bit of a check. So, you know, as a writer, I might ask, okay, well, does this product feature work in the way I think it does? Is it going to answer this audience's challenges in a way that I think it does? Um, and it's useful just to have that technical voice to go, no, it doesn't work like that actually. And uh, I have to find another way around uh, the messaging for that. So again, might be one person covers all of these. It might be if you're a marketing uh, manager and you attend a lot of events and talk to customers, you can fulfill the first two bullets. Um, but I think if you have somebody with these hats on, you'll, you'll get um, a lot of mileage out of your briefing calls. Cool, and um, general call prep, aside from these things I just mentioned. Um, again, your writer should come prepared and as a as the writers here know you probably do put a lot of time into call prep but what could you as a marketing person do to to prep for the call and set it up again i'd encourage getting a briefing document over ahead of the call because that will give background and context and then that means the writer can prep really smart questions to come to the call with so that's a great start um the other thing i think is i've been on lots of calls where people are more than happy just to show up and kind of I don't want to say improvise. I'm sure they're very well prepared, but you know they don't need to know what questions I'm going to ask. I just show up with them written down on a notepad and ask them. And the the subject matter expert I'm speaking to is just so well informed. They just you know um, have all the answers to hand. Um, but not everyone works like that, and people sometimes like to to work from pre prepared questions so they can come with loads of answers ready. So um, if you need a writer to share any questions in advance, just, just ask them. Most people can with a bit of prior warning, it's, it's no big deal. Unless you're talking really short timelines, then you might have to change your approach a little bit. But in general, this is um, you know something writers should be willing to do. So don't be afraid to ask that, if that would help your subject matter experts. Okay, so appreciate we're uh, <laughs> coming to the end of our time slot, but I'm just gonna quickly rattle through some final um, slides. Um, 
I don't like to normally go into this sort of like, how do you fix problems on a call? Because it does feel a bit negative. But whenever I do call training with other writers, this is one of the, the first things I always get asked is, oh, what do I do if this thing, this worst case scenario happens? Um, how do I fix it? So I thought I'd run through a couple of these from a sort of marketing manager, account manager perspective to sort of just see things that you could do to avoid some of the things, well, maybe you're less anxious than I, but some of the things I might have nightmares about happening on calls. <laughs> if you have these same worries, here's how you can fix them. So if a call doesn't have a clear direction, maybe there's just some sort of misalignment going on. There's a few simple ways to fix that, I find. Um, taking a little chunk of time up front on a call, particularly if it's a longer call with more people involved, just a couple of seconds to, after you've introduced people, just go, okay, here's what we want to cover on the call today. Here's what it's about. Here's what we hope to get out of it. It doesn't take that long to do that. And it can be really, really useful, especially if you've got a lot of very, very busy subject matter experts who might have their heads in loads of different projects. That's just great for getting everybody on the same page and off to the best start. And I think sometimes then if you start to drift off topic, maybe you've got a couple of subject matter experts on a bigger call and they're kind of, I don't want to say bickering, but you know, they might be talking amongst themselves, drawing things off, off track, and you see your poor writer there thinking, hmm, can I get in and stop them? Is that going to be politically fraught for me to do that? Um, it, it, it might be best if you, as a sort of marketing person, jumps in for them or gives them sort of a, a bit of encouragement and permission to jump in. Because I know when I've been brought in as a sort of external person, it's quite hard to know sort of what the, the vibe is going to be, you know, I feel like an, an outsider. I don't want to jump in on something that might be a bit of an internal discussion. So, um, yeah, if you do that, you'll probably, uh, your writer will really thank you. <laughs> so please do that if you can. Um, so that's one way to solve that. Um, if you're part of an interview and, and uh, people giving the answers, they're just not quite getting into a lot of depth uh, in their answers to questions. Um, this can happen for all sorts of reasons, I think. Some open-ended questions can be a really good way just to avoid any monosyllabic sort of yes, no answers. Um, so, you know, why does this work the way it does? What's really happening here? Just something to encourage them to kind of take the conversation in a direction that they're more comfortable with. That can yield some really good answers. Um, one of my favorites is just at the end of calls to ask if there's anything else important about the topic. Um, that, that's always, I think, where you get <laughs> the really interesting disclosures right at the end of a call. Somebody will suddenly remember a real, a real nugget of information that changes uh, the whole project for me, at least. Um, so that's a good question to add. If your writer doesn't do it, then uh, I'd encourage you to do so. Uh, and finally, you know, if someone's just clearly struggling a bit with the call, I think um, offering to do the call at another time or just to send questions over email, it's not the best way to do it over email because you lose that kind of live question and answer feel. But it, it, some people are much more comfortable with that and they might give um, more complete answers as a result. So don't be afraid to use that tactic as well. Um, and again, on the same theme of rescheduling calls, if you need to, if you have a big technical or scheduling issue, it happens. Um, try and solve the problem if there's an obvious solve um, in terms of the sort of technical hiccups that might happen on Zoom and Teams um, and what have you. Um, but if, if you can't, you know, timelines allowing just rescheduling is the best thing um, because, you know, calls are very important. It's worth taking the time to, um, to make sure you have them and, and do them properly with your writer. Um, they'll really thank you for it and it will lead to a better project in the end. Okay, so final note about briefs. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about desk research because this is a really common thing that I see in briefs where um, you know, the brief will just kind of ask for desk research to supplement or come up with ideas or, or what have you. Um, and I think that's absolutely fine to ask a writer to do, by the way, but only for some things. It, it can augment a piece. If you say you're doing something uh, and you want proof points, you want stats, you want customer testimonials, you want quotes from industry leaders, what have you, you know, your writer can and absolutely will be happy to go off and do that, that's fine. But if you're asking them, say, to come up with thought leadership blog ideas, um, just using Google, you know, at that point, it's not really thought leadership anymore. It's just what everyone else is saying on Google. Um, speaking of finding industry leader quotes, I found this lovely one from Ashley Faust, who um, she's been on the Radix podcast at least once. Um, she's the content strategy leader at Atlassian and a very smart marketer. And she has said this far better than I just did that, um, Yes, uh, if you want to build thought leadership content and there's a lack of SMEs, don't just send your writer to Google. It sort of undermines the point. So um, yes, don't be afraid to ask for desk research to be done to augment a piece, but don't rely on it to fill in all the briefing elements we've just talked about because it, it never leads to, to particularly uh, good content from my experience. Okay, so 
long list of information for you there, but we are at the end, I promise. And the summary, thankfully, is a very simple one, because again, we've talked about two main things, our written briefs and our calls. And this is the summary of how you get it all right. You send a full brief, as full as possible, including the most important background information, but hopefully not overwhelming your writer in the process. And then you set up a call afterwards. Your writer can come in and ask questions around that brief to really smart people in your organization and go away and probably do an amazing job. At least I certainly hope so. Amazing. Okay, Whew. that was a whistle stop tour. Um, now's the time for all the questions that may have been building. I can see there's a few notifications in chat. So I will just take a look and see. Oh no, they're not questions. They're from you, David. <laughs> okay, well, if you do have any questions, now is the time to ask them. Please feel free to put them in the chat or in the Q&A box. Um, and I'd love to answer them for you. While we're waiting for, um, for any other questions, George, I wonder if you had any more that you wanted to say on, on Andrew's question about how to get your clients to give you more information without upsetting them. <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry, I'm just reading, Andrew, what you've put in the Q&A box yeah. now as a sort of supplement to that, because um, I think this is a really interesting topic and I wanna make sure I go into proper depth with it for you. Um, Yes, how do you do it? So this is, the, yeah, not upsetting clients. So this is the tricky thing, isn't it? I, I, I like to think most clients, if you just said to them, hey, I'd really love to have a call about this. I'd like to hope there's no implicit judgment there. At least I certainly hope there isn't because I've definitely done that before for clients. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's a certain level of tact to, uh, to doing it, um, which I'm not going to pretend I have for even a second. But I think it's worth the risk sometimes because I, I genuinely think, you know, the best work is always done after a call. I really think it is that important. And I think ultimately, even if somehow your client does become a little bit offended or feels like they're being called out for their brief or what have you, I think when they see the results, they'll probably think it was worth it in the end to kind of have that call, even if they may have uh, felt a little bad when you first suggested it. Um, in terms of other ways to handle the situation, by the way, if you're not comfortable going straight in and going, okay, let's get a call going, um, if you think that might come across poorly, um, I think one of my favorite things to do is if you have a slightly longer piece uh, is to introduce kind of another stage of feedback. So we often do outlines for white papers, eBooks, um, things like that. Anything that's gonna go over about 1,000, 1,500 words where we you know we'll just do bullet points and sketch out the argument and send it to them. And often if a client, isn't necessarily amazing at getting you a written brief. What will happen is when they see something come back to them that maybe isn't quite right, you've maybe not got the right order of points or you've not fully understood the topic, that's the point where they go, ah, okay. And then they'll come in with loads of information to correct anything, explain things further, add details. Um, that can be a really good way just around the whole issue. And it's quite a good practice anyway for longer pieces just to make sure you don't write a lovely, beautiful white paper and then find out the structure is not what they were looking for. So um, that can be a good way around it as well. One thing I'd probably su suggest is that you can also slightly put it on yourself if you feel confident enough to, to do that and confident enough in your relationship with the client. You, you know, you, instead of going, this isn't good enough, you go, could you just help me with it? So, so like you're asking them for, for like a bit of additional help. Um, could you just help me to understand this? It's probably me um, or something like that and, and get clarification that way but you put but but you make it sound like you're embarrassed rather than you, that you're criticizing them but that kind of i think sort of depends a bit on your personal brand and your relationship with them i suppose if you're as groveling as i am andrew naturally and by default then you'll just do that anyway right like <laughs> <laughs> i certainly hope you're not like me but uh, yes that can be a really good way david that's a really good piece of advice um great i'm oh i've uh, got a question in from veronica uh who asks uh do you do a summary of the project from your point of view before you start this sounds a little bit like uh your outline point that you, that you were just making but i didn't know if you wanted to go yes. into more detail there yeah i absolutely yeah i'd love to that's a really uh, good question veronica because i think this is like really really important for the briefing stage and it has to happen at some point i think um just to avoid any misunderstandings so the the outline stage i suggested for longer pieces that can be a great way of, of 
getting that summary to a client and having that interaction about it. But I think also on briefing calls, that's a great time to do it. And I think most writers who are pretty experienced at interviewing will kind of do that thing where they'll reframe something back to the person they're speaking to and go, you know, okay, so the way I understand it is this, or is this the story we're trying to tell? And then you'll have that interaction where you've kind of given a bit of a summary and the, the client will get a chance to kind of feedback. Um, yeah, so hopefully that answers uh, that one. Absolutely. absolutely, I couldn't agree more, George. I, I think that that's always a, a really nice moment towards the end of a briefing call where you just kind of reflect back what they've said to them hopefully in a more kind of succinct way or from a slightly different angle. And they either go, no, not quite. Or they go, oh, wow. Yeah, that's exactly mm. what I just said. Um, but either way, it's really, it's really helpful. Mm. Um, I'm not sure if we have any more questions coming in, um, but maybe if we um, want, while we just give people a, a, a final uh, chance to ask any final questions, uh, I guess I'd just like to thank you on everyone's behalf, George. That was um, really helpful um, and just very clear and insightful, as we, we would always expect from you. Yeah, thanks, so that's, um, that's uh, very helpful, and um, there's kind of lots of, of, of love for, for, for you and the things that you're sharing in the, in the chat as well. So, uh, so thank you for that. Uh, for those of you that are uh, watching, thank you so much for, uh, for attending and, and um, sharing your time with us today. Sorry we overran slightly. Um, a, we've got a, uh, you know, so many good questions. Uh, today if you'd like to keep uh, in touch with us and get uh, notified of, of future webinars um, then um, there is uh, ah you've got the newsletter link there it's also in the uh, in the chat George is way ahead of me <laughs> um, if, you, if you don't already uh, subscribe to our newsletter we'll keep you up to date with um, webinars and other copywriting advice in future so thank you so much George is there any any final words before I, uh, before I officially call the meeting to a close? I'll let my slide do the talking and say thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, George, and thanks, everyone, for attending. Hopefully we'll see you again soon.